Good morning everybody. My name is Geert Uitroeven. Welcome to my presentation, Gadgets and Trinkets, the Upstream Linux Way. I will start by giving a short introduction about myself and about the topic. Then I will continue with device drivers in Linux, hardware descriptions, and finally there will be some time for live questions. I got involved with Linux a long time ago, in 1994, as a hobbyist, helping the port of Linux to the Amiga platform. Later I worked on various other platforms and architectures, PowerPC, MIPS, PlayStation 3 with the cell broadband engine, and I also used to be maintainer of the Linux frame buffer device subsystem. Currently I'm a maintainer of the M68K architecture, still as a hobbyist, but a few years ago I became a freelance embedded Linux kernel hacker, and in that context I've been mostly doing contract work for Renesas to help in upstreaming support for their uh, ARM SOCs. And uh, for that I'm the maintainer for the Renesas clock and pin control drivers and for the Corm ARM SOC platforms. In this presentation I will help you understand how to connect simple devices to a Linux system and use them from Linux, of course. Simple devices can be sensors, motors, switches, LEDs, actuators, displays, solenoids. And this is important not only for makers who, for example, want to make a robot or a 3D printer, but also for industrial automation, why you want to control and monitor large machines. Probably you've seen one of these kits, which uh, contain lots of sensors you can connect to your Arduino or Raspberry Pi. But this can also extend to larger machines, like for example this excavator, which is really have containing a Linux board and only makes all Linux in here to monitor the operation of the system. These days, many people get uh, familiar with electronics on an Arduino. It's a very simple platform containing a microcontroller where you can easily connect multiple simple devices. There's a large ecosystem with lots of libraries supporting most popular devices. You're not limited to one particular hardware platform. You also have uh, ESP32 and TNC, which can use the Arduino environment. Disadvantages of our Arduino are that there can be a limited processing power depending on the power of the microcontroller and there's also no hardware description which means that uh, your application needs to hard code all devices that are present in software most boards do have led connected to pin 13 but that's about uh, the only thing you can rely on all the rest of you have to take care of in your application the arduino uh, provides several apis to uh, talk to devices. Some of them uh, are used to, to handle pins. You can configure a pin, which is basically a GPIO for input or for output. You can uh, read and write for it if it's a, a digital pin, or you can uh, read and write analog values if it's a pin that's connected to an ADC or to a pulse bit modulation output. There's also support through libraries for uh, I2C devices, serial peripheral interface, uh, serial port, UARTs, and uh, also for the one wire. To talk to your devices on a bus, there are separate libraries, for example, the TELUS temperature library, which allows you to read the temperature from a temperature sensor that's connected to a one wire bus. On the other side, we have Linux. Um, for many people, Arduino becomes uh, too limited and they may want to switch to a higher performance platform like Linux. Linux here is a platform of choice for devices that have a real operating system with multitasking and uh, as that also provides TCP IP connectivity that can be over Ethernet or wireless. There's a very large ecosystem supporting Linux and there are similar like for Arduino, lots of drivers supporting most popular devices. Processing power on a Linux system can range from a single core system with only a few megabytes of RAM to supercomputers with hundreds of processors and terabytes of RAM. Unlike Arduino, uh, Linux usually provides a hardware description. For some devices, it's not really needed because they're auto-discoverable, like uh, PCI devices. 
other devices can be described by uh, firmware, ACPI on, uh, on, on PCs or uh, real open firmware on uh, some of the older Sun and uh, PowerPC boxes. But for embedded devices, this is mostly done handled through the flattened device trees, which is a hierarchical method to describe the devices on your system. Embedded devices traditionally also used board files, which were just C files containing structure definitions describing the hardware, but this is uh, being replaced by a flattened device tree. Unlike Arduino, there's a real operating system running when if you have a Linux system and with a strict separation between kernel and user space. Most of the drivers are living in kernel space and the application is living in, usually living in user space. You can have user space drivers. And of course, if you have a really embedded system, you could have your application in kernel space, but it's better to maintain the separation uh, between kernel and user space because this will make your system much safer. And to communicate be between these two layers, there are standardized APIs. Due to these APIs, it means that you can replace both platform and peripherals without changing the application. So for example, uh, based on availability, price, performance, features like uh, industrial temperature ranges, you may want to decide to change your computer, a single board computer like a BeagleBone Black, and replace it by a Raspberry Pi or a Linux Senior. And uh, because of these APIs, all of that is possible. It's also possible to change uh, sensors if you have a, a, a temperature sensor, but it turns out that your device needs to be used in an in a environment where it can be colder or hotter than supported by the sensor. You can just switch it by this, uh, replace the sensor by, by another one that suits your uh, requirements. And uh, due to the standardized APIs, it means that you don't really have to change your, your application. Let's now show a smart example. Uh, suppose you have a LED on your Arduino connected to pin, pin 13, which is LED built-in, and you want to blink it. On Arduino, you have first have to configure the pin as an output in the setup function, and then you can have a loop that uh, enables the LED, waits a bit, disables the LED, LED, wait a bit, and so on forever. Very simple probably the first program everybody uh, writes on uh, the Arduino. Now, of course, the question is, if we move to Linux, can we do the same on Linux? And can we do that from user space? Let's give it a try. The first example I'm showing you is using the Linux uh, SysFS GPIO. Um, first, you have to tell Linux that you want to use the GPIO from user space, so you export GPIO number 953, for example. Then you have to configure the direction you want to use as the output pin because it has to drive LED. And then you can toggle the LED by writing one or zero to a special value file in SysFS. There are also shorthands to configure direction and value directory to avoid uh, the glitches. No, that sounds simple. Of course, where does this magic number 953 come from? And is it always the same number? These are good questions. A disadvantage of the SysFS GPIO is that uh, these numbers are difficult to obtain. So you have, they are based on which GPIO controller it is and which GPIO on which GPIO controller. And worse, they depend on probe order of drivers, if you add devices to the system, so the, yes, the numbers can change, so they're not really stable. Um, there are other issues with this API, and that's why SysFS GPIO has been deprecated uh, and is being replaced by something better. Uh, I'd like to uh, point out that there are also Arduino-alike libraries uh, for various programming languages on top of this interface. Uh, so you could still use a program that looked very similar like uh, the one I showed for the Arduino. Is there a better way to talk to the LED? Yes. The SysFS GPIO 
API has been deprecated, but the replacement has been written, which is the correct device for GPIO. There's also a user space library for that uh, libgpiod to make it easier to uh, to use this uh, card device uh, GPIO API. Uh, together with libgpiod, some uh, tools are uh, bundled, so you can easily use it from uh, the shell, for example, as well. So let's run, uh, for example, uh, a few of those commands. I run GPIO detect. It shows me that on my system there are several GPIO controllers called GPIO ships. Uh, each of them has uh, multiple GPIO lines. So uh, the names you see in between square brackets, they indicate uh, bus addresses and types. So for example, the top one is 605. That's a GPIO controller on the SOC, the GPO ship A, that's uh, a device on an I2C bus, on I2C bus 4, the device with address uh, 20 in hex. And the last one is a GPIO controller connected to a PMIC. So as you can see, it's much easier to find out which GPIO you want to talk to. There's also a GPIO info command, which shows you even more information about it also shows you what the GPIOs are actually used for in the system, which can help finding, uh, which you can use from user space. Because of course you cannot use a GPIO from user space if it's already in use from a device driver in kernel space. So how do I now control my LED? Suppose my LED is connected to GPIO 19 of GPIO ship 2, then I can use GPIO set disable the LED or to enable it. The GPIO set to enable it, you have to be very careful with that because when you close the character device, it restores the state to the original state of the, the GPIO, which means that if you just run GPIO set, set 19 equals 1, it will enable the LED and then when GPIO set quits, it will restore to the old state, which means that it will blink only very briefly. If you want to uh, let it stay enabled for, for example, 500 uh, micro milliseconds, then you can use the, the minus M time option. And if there are, you can also keep the GPIO asserted until uh, you uh, quit the application, for example, uh, by pressing a key or using the minus M wait option. In the last example, you also see that you can control multiple GPIO lines from one command, which means that uh, if they are on the same as they're on the same GPIO ship, that usually this can be done in one atomic operation, changing all three GPIOs at once which is something that was not possible with the old uh, CFS API. So, can we do better? Yes, we can. Because if Linux would know that there's an LED connected to it, then we can use the CFS LED interface. Now, we can just change the brightness by uh, writing a 0 or 1 to a special file in CFS. There are other things we can do because uh, there are triggers, LED, LED triggers with uh, our small kernel drivers on top of the LED subsystem, which can control the LED for you without uh, you having to do anything during user space. For example, if you write uh, activity to the trigger file, it means that the uh, LED will now uh, represent uh, the load state of the system. There are also triggers for other things, uh, for disk activity, uh, network activity. Popular one is also the heartbeat, which does show this thump thump on your LED. Another interesting one is the, the pattern driver, which means that uh, you can just program a, a pattern and the kernel driver will take care of, uh, of handling the pattern. So you don't, your user space doesn't have to do that at all. In the first example, I create a pattern of 500 uh, milliseconds low, 500 milliseconds high, uh, which is suitable for uh, 
uh, pulse with modulated LEDs um, because uh, actually the pattern uh, implements uh, doesn't do uh, discrete change status. Uh, it's with the example I gave there, it will uh, change from brightness zero to 255 during uh, the time period of 500 milliseconds, and then it will go from 255 to zero in 500 milliseconds. If you have uh, a binary LED, which can just be turned on or off, as soon as the, the brightness becomes one, it will turn on. So you have to use a slightly different pattern like the one at the bottom where uh, I tell it to uh, to use uh, brightness zero to go from brightness zero to zero during a period of 500 milliseconds uh, which means that it will be really off during that period and then I will switch it immediately from zero to 255 which is uh, enabled and then I will leave switch it from 255 to 255 during a period of 500 milliseconds, so it will just stay enabled all the time, and then the same for uh, disabling it again. So this is a small example that shows you that uh, kernel drivers uh, can help you as well, because you don't have to uh, configure uh, control your LEDs from uh, user space if you have a kernel driver for that. Uh, of course, it means that you need to have to tell Linux that there's actually a LED connected to the GPIO, which is something uh, we will talk about later. Now, if you're uh, having a Linux system, there are two ways that you can uh, approach this. Uh, one of them is uh, out of three Linux, which is a Linux version where you can do whatever you want. You can come up with whatever custom and hacky solutions, what you, uh, whatever you, that you can uh, imagine. But it does mean that there will be less sharing. A better way is to go with upstream Linux and try to get your to work with the upstream community and do it the upstream way. And then you can get your stuff integrated uh, with the upstream kernel, which allows you to have more sharing and uh, get uh, easier maintenance uh, when upgrading to later kernels. So that's important if you have a longer term vision. Of course, this means that before you can get your work accepted upstream, you have to follow the, the written and unwritten rules of uh, the upstream Linux kernel. Okay, we have arrived at the, the second section, which is about uh, Linux device drivers. So uh, first I'll start talking about uh, user space drivers. So at the bottom level in your system, you will have the hardware. On top of that, there will be a Linux kernel running with low level drivers which are typically bus drivers for I2C, GPIO, SPI, UART. On top of that, there will be higher level generic drivers, which provide the interface to the user space to talk to the devices. Examples of those is I2C dev, which provides a file in a, a special device file under slash dev. And that file allows you to control uh, devices on the I2C bus. It's important here, it, it, this is a device that uh, corresponds to the bus. So using that device, you can talk to all devices that are present in the I2C bus. There's also a generic driver for the GPIO ship, which I already talked about with uh, the CARDEV uh, GPIO driver. So this provides a slash dev GPIO ship device, which corresponds to one uh, GPIO controller. For the SPI, the serial peripheral interface, it's uh, different. There will be a there can be a dev SPI dev device, but that corresponds to one particular device only, and you can only use it to talk that to that one particular device and not to all the devices on the SPI bus, unless they have their own dev SPI dev device. This device is not always available, and uh, means that you have to tell Linux that you want uh, to use SPI dev. For serial ports, it's a very classical device, the dev TTY S uh, device to talk to, uh, to UART. And for uh, pulse width modulation, there's also an uh, interface under the SysMS file. Now, let's have a look at the kernel space drivers. Um, 
in this case, the high-level drivers will be uh, device-specific drivers uh, to talk to devices that are connected to the low-level bus there. Uh, on this slide, I showed them not straight on top of the low-level devices because typically a device like uh, the Block B might talk to a device that's connected to I2C bus and there may be other uh, may also involve controlling some GPIOs. Um, these high-level drivers they provide APIs uh, to uh, slash dev special files or uh, to CFS as well, but these these are not generic, not as generic as the previous ones, but they depend on uh, the device and on uh, the subsystem. So let's compare user space and kernel space drivers. Um, many people who come from uh, uh, Arduino, they like to use uh, user space drivers because it's the workflow is very more similar to what they were used to before. Um, can also be simpler to get something to work. Um, there may be other reasons why people want to use a space driver. For example, if uh, the device is a proprietary device without public documentation, licensing of the device driver could uh, come into play. Um, the device might, for example, be some custom microcontroller uh, that's connected to an I2C or an SPI bus, and there's a custom protocol talking to the microcontroller. So in that case, it might make sense to to implement it in user space and use, uh, for example, S SPI dev. Disadvantages of those of a user space driver is that it makes it more difficult to reuse and share uh, the drivers. Um, if the device uses interrupts, it can be complicated. You still is UIO to, to use interrupts from user space, but I don't know whether it's used that much anymore. Um, a user space driver can also have more overhead, especially if you uh, want to bit bank GPIO or something like that. Uh, and then uh, the kernel space driver might be more uh, convenient there. Um, kernel space drivers, they are usually more efficient. They, if they're in the upstream kernel, they allow for reuse. Um, as kernel space drivers usually use a specific API inside Linux, it's easier to abstract the hardware, which means that you can, can replace the hardware uh, later, uh, but keep the interface and your application doesn't have to be changed. Kernel space drivers also allow integration with other subsystems. That's, for example, if you, you have a, a, a serial flash connected to a I2C bus, uh, if you talk to that from user space, then yeah, you, you, that's that's all you have. If you, you to use it from uh, the kernel, then it means that you can have uh, block layer subsystems on top of that and things like that. For media devices, if it's, it's a camera or something like that, you want to connect it to the, the media pipelines in the other parts of the kernel. From kernel space, it's easier to use interrupts, but disadvantages are that kernel space drivers are typically considered more complex than user space drivers. And if you want to upstream them, there's an upstreaming effort. If you're not familiar with that, it can be sometimes be a bit difficult to get your changes accepted upstream. Um, personally, I think there are many too many user space drivers these days uh, for the various uh, fruit computers like the Raspberry Pi and 96 ports. Uh, you can find all these user space libraries uh, for those driving devices, while uh, in many cases having a kernel driver for it would make it much easier uh, and simpler and more convenient for people uh, to use it. An example here is the, the, the popular uh, Hitachi HD 44780 character LCD. Probably you've seen it before because it's been used in uh, printers, copiers, fax machines, uh, lots of uh, machines, lots of uh, devices. Um, basically, consider, con is a character LCD driver with a, a parallel bus, which can be either 4 or 8-bit uh, and a few control signals. Uh, most of the devices have a, a backlight, which LED that uh, makes sure that the display is easy to read. And, but even in the 4-bit mode, um, you already need uh, quite a lot of pins to drive it. So uh, many of these uh, LCDs, there's uh, some serializer block in front of it, which converts between the serial protocol and the parallel protocol that uh, the display needs. <coughs> 
So if you have a user space driver for uh, all these variants of the LCD, then you easily end up with five or more different drivers. So one for the, the basic GPIO parallel version, 4-bit and 8-bit, then a version which, that supports uh, LCD where you have an I2C uh, GPIO expander in front of it, another driver if you have an SPI IO expander, another one for the one wire, and then perhaps you, you probably have many devices uh, that have, where they use a custom microcontroller in front of it, and that also changes the protocol slightly, so you need lots of drivers for that. Now, if you want to do it from kernel space, so uh, Linux used to have a driver for these L character LCDs for about 20 years or something like that, and it was a variant that was connected to the, the parallel port. So a while ago, I converted that driver to, uh, to use uh, GPIOs, which means that you could uh, connect it to your GPIO and uh, use it. And because Linux already has support for several IO expanders, as soon as you can tell Linux that your LCD controller is connected to one of these GPIO expanders, it will just use that existing driver and it will work out of the box. Of course, if your serializer block in front of the LCD is some custom microcontroller, you still need some custom front end for the, the kernel driver and uh, currently somebody, someone is uh, submitting something for some for one of these, uh, but you can already see that uh, there's less work involved in uh, doing it from kernel space than from user space. Now, what kind of drivers does Linux already have for simple devices? Uh, there are several input drivers, uh, if, like uh, GPIO keys. So if you have switch, switches connected to your uh, GPIO for input, that's definitely supported. Also support for uh, matrix keypads where you have uh, multiple switches connected in a matrix. Um, yeah, I compare that to uh, what I found on the internet where somebody is doing that from uh, user space. So he's, uh, he's pulling multiple GPIOs from user space to catch when you're pressing a, a key. Uh, there's also support for rotary encoders, uh, touch screens, and all of that is uh, handled from user space through the uh, EVDEF and the DEF input event uh, device file. There's also support for simple output devices like LEDs, uh, um, binary LEDs, LEDs with uh, pulse width modulation. Lots of displays are con uh, supported to DRM system. There's even support for bit bank bus implementations for I2C, uh, SPI, and one wire. So even if you don't have a hardware controller for one of these buses, then uh, you can, uh, can use it. Another big part of uh, drivers for uh, um, sensors, uh, ADCs, uh, analog digital converters, digital analog converters are uh, the industrial I.O. Uh, subsystem in Linux. Most of these are uh, devices that are connected to uh, I2C or SPI bus and they control to uh, SysFS. Um, there's a user space library, libio, to uh, make it easier to talk these devices. Um, I'm showing you an example of uh, querying uh, devices on a board. So uh, libio has support for multiple backends. Uh, it can talk to local devices, but it can also talk to devices connected to USB or connected to uh, another board over Ethernet, for example. So in this example, I'm uh, querying uh, another board, the uh, Renesas uh, Salvator XS board. And IO Info can tell me information about all of the devices it finds. Uh, the list is too long to fit on the slide, so I'm just showing uh, a part of it. If you're interested in LibIO, I suggest that you uh, attend a presentation that will be given uh, tomorrow. Another example driver that's available is uh, for drivers for uh, pulse width modulation. So pulse width modulation is a system where you have a, a square wave with a, a fixed period and a varying duty cycle that's typically used for uh, for controlling motors and LEDs. 
um, in kernel there's a driver PWM LEDs which allows you to control the brightness of LEDs and uh, most other in kernel use is uh, limited to display backlights but fortunately you can use it from uh, user space to say SysFS which is the interface which is very familiar, familiar very similar to the legacy GPIO uh, SysFS interface um, so far, there's no character device, uh, user space API, or uh, lib PWMD yet, like there is for uh, GPIO. But I heard there's in definitely interest from people for having that because it would allow to synchronize controlling multiple uh, uh, PWM signals, uh, which is currently not possible with uh, the with the current uh, SysFS uh, API. Now we had PWM. Um, We are arrived at uh, another hot topic, which is the uh, RGB LEDs. Um, this is a bit uh, complicated. So a while ago, I read on uh, uh, LinuxWeekly.net that there was a, a patch series posted to add support for multicolor LEDs. It was already at version 30. <laughs> um, the good news is that version 31 made it into the uh, Linux version 5.9 uh, RC1. Um, this is not a pure RGB uh, LED control uh, framework. Um, it's a framework that allows you to control um, the global and local brightness of a string of LEDs. So it means that you can configure for a brightness for each of the individual LEDs, and then you can uh, change the global brightness of the whole string uh, later, the intensity basically of uh, uh, the whole string. Uh, so if the individuals, if st uh, LEDs in the strings are RGB, L are the individual R, G, and B components of LEDs, then it means it has some uh, RGB support. Uh, using that, then you can control the, the local brightness will then be the, the color uh, control and the global one will be uh, global brightness of, uh, of all the RGB LEDs, uh, LEDs combined. But uh, yeah, it's obvious that the RGB LEDs need uh, more love in the kernel, um, especially if we're considering these uh, neopixels and dot stars, which are these small uh, RGB LEDs that you can control uh, to a serial uh, bus. Uh, especially for neopixels, it's a bit complicated because they need uh, precise timings. Uh, on microcontrollers, pe people typically use uh, the SPI controller if they want to to control a long strings of uh, uh, neopixels or they use some special DMA controller. Uh, so far, there's uh, no upstream support there. And well, I would love to see that uh, change, of course. Another gap are uh, motors and actuators. Currently, there's no GPIO motors, relays, or actuators, unlike GPIO LEDs. Uh, I think the main reason for that is that there's no motor subsystem in uh, Linux kernel, while there is an LED subsystem. Uh, so what people typically do if they just want to control uh, a relay is to uh, treat it as a LED and then use the GPIO LEDs uh, driver. So how would you control a motor? Typically, that's done through a edge bridge, which I show at, uh, at the upper left of, uh, of my slide. So it's called the edge bridge because the wiring looks like the, the letter H. Uh, it involves uh, four switches, A, B, C, D, and depending on which switches are enabled, uh, the motor will uh, spin or uh, in one direction, spin in the other direction, stop or break. For example, if you uh, uh, close switches A and D, the motor will uh, run in one direction. If you slow, close switches B and C, it will run in the other direction. Um, many driver uh, ICs to implement uh, edge bridge, uh, they also provide an uh, enable signal that can be pulse width controlled. Um, and well, I think that Linux could do with a generic edge bridge edge bridge driver that would allow describing devices like that and controlling them from uh, user space with a simple interface in SysFS to, 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 to turn the motor in one direction, the other direction, stop, brake, control speed, if it's a PWM-enabled uh, device. 
but that's something that uh, definitely needs to be added. Finally, uh, one other uh, driver I would like to talk about is the GPIO aggregator, which I uh, which I wrote and which was accepted in uh, version 5.8. So, as I told you before, a GPIO uh, can be controlled with the character device interface by accessing a, a dev GPIO ship file. Now, this ship, this device file allows you to control all GPIOs on the GPIO controller, um, which can be a problem, like uh, it's not uncommon for a board that you it has a GPIO controller where one GPIO is used for a very critical uh, system operation and the other one are used for, for other external devices. So if you uh, change the permissions on dev GPIO ship that uh, a user can control the, the device he wants to control, then he also has permission to control the critical GPIOs, which is a bit uh, unsafe. So I came up with a solution to uh, create a new virtual GPIO chip, the GPIO aggregator, which allows you to uh, aggregate multiple existing GPIOs and combine them into a new GPIO chip. And that new GPIO chip has its own dev GPIO chip file and then you can change permissions on that. And then the user who has permission to access this can only use the GPIOs that are aggregated through the GPIO aggregator and not all the other GPIOs on the parent GPIO chips. An example I'm giving here uh, shows you how to uh, combine GPIO 19 from one GPIO chip and GPIOs 20 and 21 into a new GPIO chip by writing to a special file in SysFS, the new device file. And uh, that shows you that then GPIO info can show you the new chip. And you can change permission of the, the file to to give someone access. Um, this started as a, actually a way to uh, export GPIOs to a virtual machine, but it turned out to be a, a useful feature for uh, for other uh, use cases as well. Uh, the GPIO aggregator can even be used as a generic GPIO driver, like uh, I2C dev and SPI dev for uh, other buses. I'll talk about, about that later in the next section. So we have arrived at the uh, hardware description. So what's hardware description? Basically, it's about uh, telling Linux what di devices are present on the system. So because if Linux doesn't know what devices are present, then drivers cannot access those devices. And then, uh, of course, applications cannot access them as needed. So for several types of uh, buses, there's an uh, auto probe. For example, a PCI or one wire. Uh, if a device is present, it will be detected automatically. <laughs> I2C devices are typically described, but there's a the way to add, to tell Linux that there's a, a device present by writing to a new device file in SysFS, like I showed you for the GPIO aggregator. Uh, so the example there, it shows you that there's a PCF8574, which is a GPIO expander present at uh, address hex 24. Um, the special device files uh, dev I2C and dev T2IS, they are always available as soon as, soon as Linux knows that the device is there. Um, typically these days, uh, devices are described in a device tree, which is a hierarchical system where you have uh, multiple nodes and each node describes a device. Um, the type of the device is identified through a compatible value and a few other properties that indicate uh, registers and interrupts and maybe device specific properties and then uh, more complicated things like uh, subnodes and links to other devices to uh, P handles. An example here is a SPI controller with a SPI device. Um, at the top, you see something, a uh, description of an SPI controller on a Renesas platform. Uh, this, typically, this is the part that's in uh, the DTS file, DTSI file that corresponds to the SOC. And the bottom shows you uh, how to add uh, an external device to this SPI controller. This is, in this case, uh, a small uh, EEPROM flash chip 
um, this is typically put in the board ID as well. One of the most common questions regarding SPI dev is that people say, I want SPI dev in DT because I want to use my device from user space using SPI dev. And then they post a patch like this. Um, but that's not accepted because the first rule of the device tree is that it describes hardware, not software policy. There's no uh, SPI dev uh, device. Uh, you should put, describe what's actually connected to the SPI bus, not how you want to talk to it. Um, so the solution to do that is use a proper compatible value. And once you have a proper compatible value, you can just add it to the SPI dev driver, which has an array of devices you can talk to. If you don't want to add it to the driver, you can also bind it manually. There's a neat trick that you can add, uh, tell the device system to uh, SysFS what driver it has to bind to. Uh, so in this case, it tells you bind the SPI device on bus one, device zero, to the SPI dev driver using the commands uh, you give there. And after that, uh, SPI dev uh, special device will appear. Um, how do you come up with a compatible value? Uh, for all cases where you have to enable your device in DT, you need uh, div uh, device tree bindings for your device. Um, if you have a device with a compatible value, my vendor, comma, my device, then consists of uh, two parts. So my vendor, it will be the vendor prefix. If it's not, not yet add, present in vendor prefixes.yaml file, then you should add it there. Um, if there are no bindings for the device yet, then you have to create uh, my vendor, uh, my device YAML file that uh, describes uh, bindings for the device. Uh, if this is a very simple, trivial device, uh, um, which could be the case for I2C, like a real time clock or something like that. We just connect to the I2C bus and first to nothing. Then it could be added to the trivial devices file. Once you have bindings, you have to make sure that you have a driver that matches it. Then you have to add the device node to the board TTS. And an important step is now we have uh, device tree bindings in uh, this YAML uh, syntax that you can run a validation command to check whether your uh, your bindings and your DTB uh, are according to the schema. Let's give an example. So I have a GPIO operate door. Um, it uses two GPIOs, one to open the door, one to lock the door. Uh, I show me here a, a sample uh, device tree bindings file for that. Um, the most important part is the, the examples that at the bottom, but it didn't fit on the slide, so I put it on the right and made it a bit larger because it's the interesting part. So it shows you that you just have, that you have a need to have a, a door device node, which is compatible with my vendor, my door, which indicates that yeah, what kind of device it is. There will be two GPIOs, one for opening the door and one for locking the door. Um, yes. This example does fails to validate because it has the GPIO lines, but uh, somewhere the tooling requires that you have a GPIO controller as well for that. Uh, but let's ignore that for now. So you have uh, created uh, bindings like this for your door. Uh, once, then the next step is getting a, a driver for that. So either you need a new driver or an existing driver. And uh, if it's an existing driver, you have to add the compatible value to the driver or you have to bind it manually. In this case, it's a very simple GPIO control device. So you could use the GPIO aggregator for that. So if you, then you can use uh, SysFS to inform the, the driver, uh, the device system that uh, you want to override the driver for the door device with the GPIO aggregator, and then you can bind it to it. And after that, you suddenly have two, a new GPIO chip with two GPIOs. And uh, this all example also shows you that due to, due to the GPIO line names in the DTS, um, this also shows up in uh, the GPIO info. And then you can also use GPIO find to find the GPIO, which makes it easier for users to 
to match uh, lines to to special devices. Now, how do you I describe my device in my DT? So one solution is to add it to the board DTS. People may consider that a bit inflexible, depending on the use case. Other options are to create a device tree overlay, which is more flexible. If you do that, then there are three options. Uh, either you load the overlay at runtime. This is something that's not supported by AppStream. Uh, yet I'll talk about that later. Um, other options are to let U-Boot load the overlay before starting the kernel. Or there's also a tool to combine a base device tree file and one or more overlays uh, into a new DTS file, which can be very helpful. Um, a sample overlay is shown here. Uh, if you compare this to the previous example where I added a, a flash EEPROM, uh, you see that it's very similar. The, the important difference is that there's a plugin uh, line at the top. Um, now a bit about dynamic overlays. Um, which can be loaded at runtime. This is something that uh, was started on uh, BeagleBone Black Cape Manager, where they had a system where you would uh, store a device ID in a small EEPROM on the bo on an expansion board. And if the expansion board is plugged in, the system would automatically detect what's present and load the device tree overlay for the expansion board. Uh, I believe this is also used on Raspberry Pi. Um, important things are that uh, what was working and what's not working. Uh, so adding SPI and I2C devices, for example, a simple platform devices works. Uh, you can change pin control, which is important for uh, SOCs that have lots of functionality on pins, but you, you have to tell the system what to map to which pin. We can enable and disable devices. Um, some things don't work, DT aliases and uh, probably multimedia endpoints and other graph stuff doesn't work, but I haven't really looked into that. Um, it's a dangerous system. You have to know what you're doing because you can really mess up your system. Uh, there are other issues with that. You can find more about it on uh, the list there. Uh, so people wonder whether we really need it. It's cool to have, but uh, we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna continue with uh, the final remark here, that it's that people have been discussing about having a, some kind of connector framework to make the overlays more safe, which means that you would describe uh, the pinout for a particular connector and then only allow an overlay that connects to that, which would uh, be sufficient for uh, most use cases that I'm aware of. Um, yes, I have a list here of uh, connectors that could be used for a proof of context concept. Uh, uh, personally, I would go, for example, for PMOD because that's a quite simple connector while it still has uh, multiplexing on the pins. Um, but that's definitely something uh, that needs more work uh, to find. So. Okay, thank you uh, for listening. I uh, would like to thank uh, a few people and organizations for allowing me to present here. And then we arrived at uh, live questions. Thank you very much.